The Lord be with you. Welcome to our worship service this morning. This is the 10th Sunday after Pentecost. It is great to see you all here this morning. A few announcements before we begin. I'm going to be away starting the 10th through to the 20th. Pastor Lutz has agreed to be on call in that time, and his number is listed in the bulletin. Next Sunday, Padre Lutz will be here leading service uh, with Holy Communion. And then the Sunday after, Regan Schmidt will be here uh, leading a lay-led service on the 20th. Our Monday night study is going to begin in September, as well as our Sunday morning study. So just keep an eye on the bulletin for official start times and dates. Those are coming up. Uh, confirmation will also begin in September. I've got one student already. If you have one who is interested, please let me know as soon as possible so we can do that. As well, I was reminded we want to keep filling our bin for the food bank uh, for those in need in our city. Uh, at this time, I heard 22,000 people making use of the food bank. Is that monthly, I'm guessing, on a monthly basis, which is almost 10% of our population. So we should probably help out where and when we are able to do so because, yeah, that's not very good at all. Um, as well, there's some additions in the library if you're looking for some summer reading here, if you want to take advantage of the, these summer days and want to sit out and read somewhere, there's a whole pile of books uh, that have been added there. Everything else I will leave to your reading. The office will be closed tomorrow for the long weekend. And yeah, so there we go. I don't think I've got anything else. It's a standard divine service setting one this morning. So at this time, I'd ask you to please rise as you are able to join in singing our first hymn, number 801, How Great Thou Art. Savior God to thee, how great thou 
shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, My God, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, O my Savior God, to Thee. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We take a time of silence for reflection on God's word and for self-examination. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with, with the introit for the tenth Sunday after Pentecost. O oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. He spread a cloud for a covering. They asked, and he brought quail. He opened the rock, and water gushed out. For he remembered his holy promise. So he brought his people out with joy. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name. We continue with the Kyrie. In peace let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. We continue with This is the Feast. This is a feast of victory for our God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Worthy is Christ. 
Christ the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people of God. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia, alleluia. victory for our God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Sing with all the people of God and join in the hymn of all creation. Blessing, honor, glory, and might to God and the Lamb forever. Amen. This is a feast of victory for our God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. For the Lamb who was slain has begun The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, though we do not deserve your goodness, still you provide for all our needs of body and soul. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may acknowledge your gifts, give thanks for all your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for our readings this morning. The Old Testament reading for the 10th Sunday after Pentecost is from Isaiah chapter 55. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, Come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you, because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. This is the word of the Lord. We continue with our psalm of the day, Psalm 136. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Give thanks to the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. To him who alone does great wonders. To him who by understanding made the heavens. To him who spread out the earth above the waters. To him who made the great lights. The sun to rule over the day. The moon and stars to rule over the night. The epistle is from Romans chapter 9. 
I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham, because they are his offspring. But... Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said. About this time next year I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might might continue, not because of works, but because of his call, she was told, the older shall serve the younger. As As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. This is the word of the Lord. We rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel, and we sing the Alleluia and verse. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia, alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now when Jesus heard about the death of John, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, We have only five loaves here and two fish. And Jesus said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I don't see any of our children this morning, so you may be seated, and we sing our next hymn, number 712, Seek Ye First.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning is the gospel reading that shows us a miraculous feeding in a desolate place. The feeding of the five loaves and the two fish should probably remind us of the miraculous feeding of the Israelites as they wandered through the deserts, right? After they had escaped Egypt, the Lord provides for them manna and quail uh, as part of uh, his provision for them as they wander through the wilderness. Now, it is interesting that if they had deep fryers between the manna and the quail, they could have made chicken nuggets for themselves. But uh, scripture does not say that that is what they did. But I like to think that maybe some enterprising Hebrew somewhere was like, you know what? I've got birds. I've got bread. I've got some oil. Maybe, maybe the first McNugget was way back there. But uh, Scripture is silent on these things, so we do not speculate where Scripture is silent. But I like to think that maybe that's what happened. And that would have been even more miraculous, right? At any rate, heavenly McNuggets aside, the Lord of heaven and earth cares for his people. This is what is shown in that Old Testament passage, right? That Jesus, the Lord, our God, cares for his people, even when they have doubted his provision for them, right? That's why they end up wandering through the wilderness for 40 years, because they don't believe they can take the promised land. And so they're like, no, we can't do it. And the Lord's like, fine, you're still going to get the promised land, but none of you who are alive, like this particular generation, will not see it. So they go wandering, but he still feeds them. So our feeding of fish and loaves in this place then calls to mind God's provision that we have seen throughout the Old Testament, that God does not leave his people alone uh, and without his compassion. Of course, looking forward, this text also points us to the eternal feast that we will celebrate with God in his kingdom that has no end. We will be in the presence of our Lord and all of our wants, and in fact, well, maybe not wants, but certainly, I don't know if they have Lamborghinis in heaven, so I don't want to, like, you know, say that all of our wants will be filled. But certainly all of our needs of body and soul will be fulfilled in heaven. And so we look forward to that eternal feast as well. And so our text for this morning points us back to look at the provision that God has had for his people in the past. But it also shows the nature of the kingdom of heaven that is to come, right? That's the entire message of Christ as he goes out in the gospels. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The reign of heaven is at hand. And so what does the reign of heaven look like? Well, it looks like compassion. It looks like feeding those who are hungry. It looks like calling to repentance those who need to be called to repentance and forgiving them. And so our text then points us in essentially three directions, right? To the past of God's care, to the present of God's care, and to the future of God's eternal care. And this, these truths sustain us for our life day to day. Because it's easy to get down and think God doesn't care for us. There's too many bad things in the world. There's too many bad things going on. In our lives, our own bodies are falling apart. I'm going bald at an alarming rate. Does the Lord even love me even anymore? And yet the scripture clearly declares that he does. That no matter what we may be going through, good, bad, ugly, or indifferent, the Lord has not abandoned us, but continues to call us into his house in this place to feed us miraculously. But there's another interesting thing in our text that I want to talk about a little bit this morning. As I was doing my research this past week, somebody noted that this feeding text, that this feast, occurs immediately after, in the Gospel of Matthew, of another feast. At the beginning of our text this morning, there's a, the very first line, when Jesus heard about the death of John the Baptist, he withdrew to a desolate place. So what occurs in the 12 verses before this before our reading picks up this morning, is Herod's birthday party. He's having, a, he's having a birthday party. He's gathered some guests to come and celebrate another trip around the sun. Um, <clears throat> but of course, he's got John the Baptist imprisoned because John uh, the Baptist was saying, hey, maybe you shouldn't be sleeping with your brother's wife while he's still alive. Maybe you shouldn't do that. And so Herod and Herodias didn't really like John the Baptist, obviously, and so they had him imprisoned. And so at this party, then, Herodias' daughter goes out, does a dance for Herod and his guests. They enjoy it, and that does, in fact, carry all of the negative connotations that you would, in fact, assume would be there. Uh, and so he's like, hey, I will give you anything you want, up to half my kingdom. And she's like, I would like the head of John the Baptist. Herod 
doesn't want to kill John the Baptist because the people like him and he doesn't want a rebellion on his hands. But he doesn't want to embarrass himself in front of his guests now either. And so he beheads John the Baptist at uh, the request of Herodias' daughter. Again, he does this because John the Baptist has been calling Herodias and Herod to repentance for their illicit extramarital relations. And so he does this then to save face in front of his guests. And so this is an interesting contrast then because the reign of Herod, which we hear about, would have heard about in these first 12 verses here, is marked by foolishness, right? He's making foolish oaths in front of his guests. And it's also marked by self-preservation. He doesn't want a rebellion on his hands and he doesn't want to embarrass himself in front of his guests. And so he does this, you know, basically despite the fact that he may have had a rebellion on his hands uh, to preserve himself. And so this is very interesting then because it shows how Herod is hosting a feast. And then the next thing that happens in the scriptures is Jesus is hosting a feast. And so you've got this contrast between these two feasts. Herod's feast is self-serving. Christ's feast is selfless. He does what he does in our text for this morning because he has compassion on his people who are like sheep without a shepherd. Where Herod kills at a feast in his honor, Jesus heals and feeds those who have come to him. This shows us a distinct difference between what kind of kingdom Christ is going to bring about versus the kingdom of the earth, right? Herod very much is all about himself. Christ is about his people about calling them to repentance, feeding them, and giving them forgiveness and everlasting life. And this miraculous feeding is the first of three miracles that occur in quick succession in the Gospel of Matthew, each miracle demonstrating something about the nature of Christ and the nature of his kingdom. And so then, we have this stark contrast between the kingdom of Herod, indeed the kingdoms of man, and the kingdom of Christ. As we have noted, Herod cares about himself, and not not looking like a fool in front of his guests. Jesus cares about the people before him, and so he preaches the truth to them. He heals them and feeds them. Herod is selfish, whereas Christ is selfless. Herod does what the crowd wants. Jesus does what the crowd needs. This is the contrast between the kingdom of man and the kingdom of heaven. And in light of this text, we should then consider our own hospitality and our own charity. This is especially true in an age of increasing busyness and also increasing isolation. How many times have you heard, I'd love to, but I'm too busy? And I mean, fair enough. Some seasons of life are busier than others, especially if you've got some medical stuff that you need to attend to, or you've got a business that you're trying to start, or whatever the case may be. And these you know, seasonal busyness, or for a season in life, fair enough. But busyness probably should not be a lifestyle, as it were. And the thing of it is, it's easy to point at Herod and say, what a self-serving goon. Sleeping with his brother's wife, enjoying a dance enough to kill a man. Man, what what a knucklehead, right? It's easy to look at Herod and be like, well, I would never do anything like that. I'm not so terrible. And perhaps our selfishness doesn't rise to that particular level of egregiousness, but it shares the same root, right? I'm busy because I'm important. That's why I'm too busy to hang out. These things that I've got going on in my life are just so important because I'm so important. And that's why we're so busy. Or there's the other side. There's jealousy that comes as we look upon the kingdoms of man, isn't there? What's, our, what's the famous Saskatchewan saying? It must be nice, right? Somebody's got something better than you, something whatever, and you're like, well, it must be nice to whatever the thing may be, uh, you know. But again, what is this tied to? This is tied to our own selfishness, right? <clears throat> it must be nice this. It must be nice that. And certainly the world doesn't help with our contentedness, right? It doesn't help that we're bombarded with endless advertising. No matter where you go, you can't turn on your TV, you can't turn on the radio, you can't even go on YouTube. 
I mean, you can subscribe to Netflix, but eventually they're going to start advertising here too because their revenue is down as well. You can't turn anywhere without things being advertised to you. And that makes it very difficult to be content because you're like, well, that certainly does look like a nicer meal than the one I had planned for lunch today or whatever the case might be. And then too, this is also aggravated by things like social media because what does that show us? The absolute best moments of a person's life. What does it not show you? Them struggling to get out of bed to go to work on Monday because they're depressed or they're anxious or whatever the thing might be. So social media doesn't help with our contentedness either, does it? Because we only see the best moments. I mean, I, on occasion, you'll get a brave soul out there who will say, you know what, I've really been struggling with the thing, and they will share, and, you know, good for them. But most of the time, what do you see? Holiday, purchase, holiday, fun time, da 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 Unless you're on my Facebook page and then it's just church and then like monster truck and then church again and then like Ninja Turtles and these kinds of things. But it's pretty accurate, right? Like, you know. And Winston. Yes, that's true. So, I mean, that's, that's, those are Tammy's posts that she tags me in. So, But even that doesn't, like, that shows him sitting nicely, right? That doesn't show him barking and all of these things. And so it's easy to be discontented in our world, in our world. And this is not something new, right? The old Adam always craves more. And this is not a new phenomenon. Certainly, it's been aggravated by some new technological advances that we are dealing with. But listen to how the book of Proverbs puts this. It says this, Sheol and Abaddon are never satisfied, and never satisfied are the eyes of man. So roughly paraphrase what this is, is just that the, so this is how it would go, Just as the appetites of death and the grave can never be filled, never can the eyes of humanity be filled. Again, this is not an affliction that is new to the 21st century. It has been around a long time. Even the scriptures acknowledge that this is a problem. We always want more than what we have. And Herod is a prime demonstration of what people will do when they're divorced from, say, the Christian faith for morality, right? What is Herod's, and this is the thing, it's easy to call out the rich and the powerful for their degeneracy, but we need to remember that sometimes we don't end up being so degenerate because we don't have access to the power that they have, right? You think if I had money, I wouldn't have more than one firebird in my garage? I'd have a collection, right? I'd be like one from each generation, you know, some stock, because that's the way it should be, then some modified because I want to go faster, right? And, and this is, a, again, a very basic example, but even my eyes would not be content given the riches of the world. I'd be like, you know what? I do like firebirds. And then I'd probably go wandering off like, well, maybe you need a challenger in there just to spice things up a little bit, just to keep the Mopar people satiated, right? And, and so they don't hit you and things. And then, well, maybe you get a Mustang so I've got something to race and beat consistently and those kinds of things. But, uh, you know, these kinds of deals, right? And this is a very, like, low-level not very serious example, but the reality is that each of us, because we are fallen into sin, are subject to the same desires that Herod had. And so then we are consistently called to repentance, right? And so here's the thing, because you'll hear this saying, right? Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. I don't think that's true. I think it's that people are corrupt by the fall into sin. So people are corrupt. And so if they divorce themselves from the church, if they divorce themselves from Christ, if they divorce themselves from repentance, then they wield that power, that authority, in accordance with their corrupt nature, then it appears as though power corrupts, although the reality is it's certainly simply a corrupt person, a corrupt, unrepentant person, wielding whatever authority it is that they have in a corrupt manner. And this is true for kings and queens. This is true for parents, right? You're like, well, how come abusive parents exist? How come they don't use the authority entrusted to them honorably and for the good of the people that God has entrusted to them? Well, because they are fallen and divorced from repentance and divorced from forgiveness. What else would you expect to occur? Divorced from the preaching of the law that says thou shalt not and divorced from believing the law when it says thou shalt not, and then disbelieving when Christ says repent when you have offended against the thou shalt nots, 
What did we expect to happen? So it's not that power corrupts. It's that the corrupt wield power. And divorced from repentance, they wield that authority, that power, in alignment with the old Adam. The old Adam that says, I want more. The old Adam that says, I want more, and I'm not afraid to take it from you. Whereas confined by the laws of God that says, thou shall not steal, then what do we think? Well, maybe I shouldn't steal. And then you get into it later, thou shall not covet. Well, I probably shouldn't be jealous then either, should I? And then when we transgress those laws, when we do thieve, when we are jealous, then what do we do? Lord, I should not have done this. Please forgive me. And then we go to our neighbor and say, I should not have done this. I should not have been jealous. I should not have stolen. I should not have smeared your reputation. And so here I am asking for your forgiveness. And this is that distinction between what the kingdom of Christ is and what the kingdoms of man are. The kingdom of Christ is marked by its compassion, but it's also marked by its discipline. What does Christ say to his people? Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. He does not say, indulge yourself, take up your riches, and follow me. He says, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Speak the truth in love, call to repentance, pray earnestly, and proclaim diligently, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And who is at the head of the kingdom? It is Jesus Christ himself, the one who takes on flesh to bear the burden and punishment for our sin. The head of this kingdom is Jesus Christ, the one who heals the sick and feeds thousands out of his mercy for them. It is Jesus Christ who comes to you today in the sacred meal of the Lord's Supper to feed you with his own body and blood. Herod sacrificed John the Baptist for his own power. Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross to save you. Herod feasted to satisfy his urges. Jesus hosts a feast to save your soul. Jesus uses his divine power in accordance with his holiness, that is, his character, his holy, perfect character, to bring the reign of heaven into the eyes, mouths, and hearts of those whom he has gathered here this morning. And he does that for you again this day. And so it may not seem as large a miracle as the feeding of the 5,000 with the five loaves and the two fish, but I can assure you it is no less a miracle. What else could we call it? Simple bread and simple wine gives to us the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins and the salvation of our souls. Is that not a miracle? The same divine power, the same divine authority that made five loaves and two fish feed well over 5,000 people, probably closer to eight or 10,000, depending on how you count, is enacted today in this sacrament so that this simple bread and wine, together with the body and blood of Jesus, forgives your sin. It delivers Christ's body and blood to you, and it assures you of your life everlasting. So what kind of king has called you here today? The king of mercy and of compassion has called you today. He has given you his gifts because he loves and cares for you. He is not content to leave you sitting in your sin leave you sitting in your death, but rather comes to you today with the medicine of immortality to forgive your sins and to save your souls for life everlasting. And so, as we look back at the feasts and the provisions that God gave his people in the Old Testament, as we read about the feast that he prepared for those folks with the five loaves and the two fish, as we consider the eternal feast that he is calling us into on the last day of the resurrection of our bodies from the grave, we celebrate this feast today, this miracle in your presence, so that you can be assured that no matter what comes in your life, good, bad, ugly, or indifferent, the Lord our God is with you. He is with you here today in bread and wine for the forgiveness of your sins. And through these simple, miraculous gifts, your sins are forgiven, and the kingdom of heaven is yours. And so we can say, thanks be to God.
And now the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. Having heard the word of our Lord and having been instructed in it, we rise and confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. This morning in our prayers, I will say, let us pray to the Lord, and your response is, Lord, have mercy. Therefore, let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. For the faithful proclamation of Christ's saving name, that God's people may be strengthened in the true faith and his kingdom extended, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, have mercy. For the holy Christian church throughout the world and for all who confess the name of Christ, that God would guard and defend us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. Let us pray to the Lord. For this congregation, its mission, and its people, for the ability to meet the needs that arise as we do the work God has given us to do, and for the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Let us pray to the Lord. For the educational institutions of our synod, for our preschools, our day schools and high schools, our colleges and universities, and for our seminaries, that those who teach and those who learn in them would be transformed by the wisdom of Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. For all who partake this day of Christ's holy body and blood, that in their eating and drinking, they may receive the benefits of forgiveness of sins and renewal of life and have a foretaste of the feast to come. Let us pray to the Lord. For those who have wandered from the faith, that the Holy Spirit would use us to call them home to the Father. Let us pray to the Lord. For the government and all who have been set into positions of leadership, that they may use the authority entrusted to them honorably and for the good of the people. Let us pray to the Lord. For all who serve in worthy occupations, professions, arts, and sciences, that God would grant them skill and integrity and the performance of their responsibilities and valued service through their vocations. Let us pray to the Lord. For those who suffer from hunger, homelessness, poverty, or unemployment, that God's great mercy and love would preserve and relieve them. Let us pray to the Lord. For all the faithful, that the Spirit would lead them to cheerful, generous giving from the bounty the Lord provides to support the church and to help those in need. Let us pray to the Lord. For those who are sick, especially Elvira Keller, Sean Brown, Colleen King, Don Lockhart, Judy Kofal, Stacy and Colleen Anweiler, Geneva, Linda Federspiel, Derek Stilling, Brock Lockhart, John Riggs, Mabel Kinzel, Earl Yelty, Donnie and Kathy Anweiler, Brad, Courtney and Mila, Cheryl, Caleb, Val Prashevsky, and Don Fry. 
that God would grant healing to their bodies and strength to bear their infirmities with patience and grace. Let us pray to the Lord. For those who mourn, especially the family and friends of Greg Rowe, that in their time of sorrow they would not lose hope, but rely on God's promise that he will never leave them or forsake them. Let us pray to the Lord. For those who rejoice in the rich blessings of God, that they may always remember the giver of every gift and give him heartfelt thanks. Let us pray to the Lord. O oh Lord, Heavenly Father, we gratefully remember the sufferings and death of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, for our salvation. Rejoicing in his victorious resurrection from the dead, we draw strength from his ascension before you, where he ever stands for us as our own high priest. Gather us together from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. For to you alone we give all glory, honor, and worship. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we gather our offering. Please rise as we sing the offertory. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call on the name of the Lord. I will take the cup of salvation and will call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people in the courts of the Lord's house in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Continue with the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. 
Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood, as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth, to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. O Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace. Come to the feast the Lord has prepared. You may be seated. <clears throat> 